Good morning. Welcome to River's Edge Community Church. We're so happy that you have joined us this morning and pray that God would really speak to all of us and open our hearts to his will. Today we begin a new series which we have entitled Above, Beyond, Below, and In. Now as you can see on the title card, uh, that will help that uh, you can remember all this because it is a rather strange sounding name. There's above, there's beyond, there's below, and then there's in. And just to help you a little bit more, I've added a byline. Above, beyond, below, and in, when it comes to moral decisions, where do we even begin? So that's the title. Now, this series not only comes right on the heels of our last series, Jesus, a man after our own hearts, but it builds on it. Jesus not only wants our hearts, but he also wants our minds, and he wants our wills. He wants us to love him with all of our heart, and he wants us to think and act correctly. To say it another way, he wants us to do the right thing and to be able to know what the right thing is. And in our confusing and complex world today, that's not always easy. And to make things even more complicated, Jesus gives us very clear instructions on how we should live and act and think. But we're not so sure we like it. Of course, I'm talking about the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus gives us the most important biblical text on how we are supposed to think about moral issues and how we are supposed to respond in moral situations. And while we were all hoping that Jesus would give us a rather wide and gracious, easy path, he did it. In case you haven't read it recently, the Sermon on the Mount is rather intense. And our response to it is pretty universal. We don't like it. Glenn Stassen says, there are two fundamental kinds of responses to the Sermon on the Mount among Christians. Efforts to obey and efforts to evade. The efforts to evade, uh, the efforts to obey came first. The efforts to evade came later, but eventually triumphed. Here's today's question. Are you an obeyer or an evader? That's what this series is all about. We're glad you're here. This we believe. Here's the truth we proclaim this morning that God is, that he is holy and just and good, that he is gracious, loving, and forgiving, that he is our king. Here is a truth we all know, that we are sinful, that we have rebelled against God and have gone our own way. Here's the truth we can scarcely believe, that God came to earth to redeem us, that God took on human flesh and lived among us. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. And we believe that Jesus came to live and to die for us, to bring us to God. That he was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. That he ascended and now sits at the right hand of God Almighty. Here is a truth we experience, that God sent his Holy Spirit to us, now we may know God's great love for us. Now we are being remade into his image. Now we are empowered to love God with all of our hearts and our neighbors as ourselves. For we are God's people, called to advance his kingdom, to called to show forth his goodness and glory, and called to follow Jesus, our King. Dave, come and pray for us, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're here this morning because you've called us. We arrive with our failures, our worries, our pains. In and of themselves, we are broke. In and of ourselves, we are broken and incomplete. And the world today reflects that brokenness. It's easy to feel hopeless that love and peace are but illusions. But we are here because you called us to be. Send your spirit to be among us. 
to transform our pain and worry, to joy, to heal our brokenness, to bring hope and peace. Bless our endeavors this morning to worship you in prayer, in singing, in hearing from your word, and in the power of your message. For you don't just call us to worship you, but to call you Father and to be your children. We seek to love you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and we seek to love others as you have loved us, but we must be transformed to do this. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from ourselves. Let us recall your unending love and faithfulness. Let us cling to the cross and see the light of the resurrection. Let us be imbued with your spirit so that yours is the light that shines on a broken world. By your grace and power, may your kingdom come. May your will be done, starting here, starting this morning. Amen. I liked his prayer focusing on brokenness because that's where our first song starts for us. Stand with us as you're able and sing.
may be seated. today is adapted from the Valley of Vision. The Valley of Vision is a collection of prayers and devotions from the Puritans. Now, the Puritans are often viewed in a negative light. In fact, most people believe that H.L. Mencken was speaking truthfully when he defined Puritanism by saying, the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. <laughs> but that's not true. Not only did most Puritans enjoy life, and were happy, but they also enjoyed God. Our prayer today shows that delight and encourages us to find it for ourselves. So we will pray this prayer together, and then I invite you to pray where you are. Whether you do so out loud or silently, it doesn't matter, but we invite you to pray for the concerns of your own heart. For we know that our God hears our prayers and moves in response to them. Let's pray together. Father God, we are your people gathered in your name, seeking your will. Fill us with your spirit so that we truly love you with all of our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves. Hear us as we pray together saying, O oh God, the end of your will is to make Christ's name glorious in heaven and on earth. To do this, you have gathered a people who will love and rejoice in his holy name. Your grace has enabled us to know Christ, to receive him as our king, to love him as our savior, to worship him as our redeemer, and to obey him as our Lord. Now, pour out your grace upon us that we may always respond to your call to be as Christ to our neighbor, to do what he would do, to love what he would love, and to walk in meekness and peace so that all the world would know of his goodness and grace. For this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's scriptures reading from Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, they, uh, turn to them the, the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your children, of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you even the tax collector doing are not even the tax collector doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagan do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's God's words for us today. Stand with us as you're able, and we continue to give praise to the Lord.
mind, rest my soul in Christ alone. Know His power in quietness and trust when the oceans rise and At this time, we would like to take up an offering. And I always get questions about why we do this. Why do we take up an offering? In our bedroom, we have a closet, we have a dresser, and I have a chair. And a lot of my clothes go on the chair. And sometimes Joe has to remind me, it's a chair, not a closet. And when I look at the pile of clothes on the chair, even without Joe telling me, I am reminded, oh yeah, there's a chair under there. It's important to be reminded about important things. We take up an offering really to remind us that our calling is to give. To give out of our treasure, sure, but to give out of our time, to give out of our talent, to give to those in need, to give those to encourage the people around you. We are called to give, and our offering is always a reminder of that great truth. May we give today joyfully. May we give today knowing that we are fulfilling somebody else's need. May we give knowing that our God is a God who gave us all things.
At this time, let us send our kids down to their classes downstairs. Let us send them off with the blessing. Say it with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. Kids, you are dismissed. What do you do when you've lost something important? Answer, you put up a sign. For instance, someone in Denver lost their parrot, and they made a sign. And from that sign, we learned that the bird was banned and that there was a reward. Unfortunately, someone else made a sign and put it up right underneath their sign. It read, Parrot Barbecue, Saturday, noon till 3. Come early. Supply is limited. Someone else lost their keys, and so they put up a sign. Lost, set of house keys, car fob, front and back door keys, and a silver safe key. If found, please return to 456 Linden Ave, apartment 1A. And then, if that was not helpful enough, he gives this helpful tip to the burglar. I'm usually home after 5 p.m. Someone else lost a ring. Their sign read, gold with description written in Elvish. Causes invisibility when worn. May cause malevolence. If found, please return to Frodo. Last one. It's another lost dog. They gave these identifying marks. Should answer to Daisy, but doesn't will bite blonde children, is angry at the world. The headline reads, lost dog, no reward. If found, keep it. <laughs> Let's face it, we're lost. When it comes to making wise moral decisions, knowing what to do and even how to think about them is far more difficult than ever before. When I was younger, everything was so clear, so black and white. But now, in my opinion at least, there's a lot more gray. Let me give you a few examples, and let's just stick with the time being to Matthew chapters 5 and 6. What are we to think about capital punishment, especially in light of Jesus' statements when he calls us to be merciful? to go the extra mile, and to love our enemies. What are we to think about Jesus' prohibition on divorce, with the only exception, cases of adultery? Even if we add Paul's statement that desertion is also proper grounds for divorce, I'm still left wondering about physical abuse and mental and emotional anguish. What are we to think about divorce? And how about Jesus' prohibition on oaths? Jesus says that anything beyond a clear and simple yes or no comes from the evil one. And yet, most of us have no problem saying the Pledge of Allegiance, or swearing an oath in court, or swearing some outrageous thing we are saying on social media is true. Is taking an oath really that wrong? And how about Jesus' command not to resist an evil person and to turn the other cheek? I get that. That is a loving response to evil. And yet, I know that many churches have armed guards at their doors to prevent anything horrific from happening during one of their services. And I get that. But how do we square this with Jesus' command? And Jesus implores us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. 
I promise you, I would have a very hard time with Jesus if I was a Ukrainian Christ follower and had in my sights a Russian soldier. Now, my point here is not that we should lean far more to the left or far more to the right than we are doing currently, but that these things are complicated. Not only that, but they are also inflammatory. People get upset when you question their political beliefs one way or another with Scripture. As I said, it's complicated. And so far, we haven't even touched upon Jesus' unrealistic commands in the Sermon on the Mount. For instance, what do we do with his prohibition of anger in verse 22? Listen to what Jesus says. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, as someone who occasionally, once a day, gets angry, I need to know if this is a great example of hyperbole or if Jesus is being really serious about that danger in hell part. And again, what do we do with this prohibition against lust? Verses 28 and 29 say, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Let's just pray that Jesus is wildly exaggerating here. Let's keep going. What do we do with Jesus' prohibition against worry? He says in chapter 6, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Really? We're not to worry? All I can say is, in this world, the one I live in, good luck with that. And then Jesus wraps up the entire first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount by commanding us to be perfect. And not just close to perfect, but to be God perfect. Here's what Jesus says. This is what we are to do. Chapter 5, verse 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I don't know about you. But when I read the Sermon on the Mount, for the most part, I feel lost. And now I hope you also feel my pain. What are we to do with these three chapters? Now, thankfully, lots of very wise people have come up with acceptable ways to evade what Jesus is saying here. For instance, here is option one. Some feel that everything that Jesus says here is directed more towards our attitudes than our actions. He is speaking more to our hearts than to our behaviors. For instance, in a war, I might say, I don't hate you, but I will kill you if I have to. And if that is true, if I actually don't hate the guy, then I would be able to say that I am following Jesus' intent in the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, as long as we are striving in our hearts to follow Jesus, it's not absolutely critical that we actually follow Jesus. Other people, option two, will argue that Jesus was talking about life in his kingdom when his kingdom comes to earth. As such, this option believes that the sermon is not so much about the here and now as it is for the then and there of eternity. An example might help. We might say, when I visit my parents in their home, I will refrain from watching Game of Thrones because of the violence, nudity, and language. But for now, in my home, 
it's okay. In other words, when we get to heaven, Jesus' words and the sermon will apply to us, but not now, not while we are still in our homes. Others, option three, will argue that the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to show us our sin and our absolute inability to keep Jesus' law. And therefore, Jesus' intent here is to lead us into repentance and to help us see how much we need his righteousness and grace. In other words, we keep the Sermon on the Mount by admitting we can't keep the Sermon on the Mount. And still others, option four, say that the Sermon on the Mount is directed only to those who are really serious about their faith. We can't keep these commands, but great Christ followers can. People like Calvin and Knox and Mother Teresa. Those few, those proud, those saints, they could do these things, but normal people like us, not so much. Yes, hyper-committed disciples can live this way, but we follow a lower calling. And still others, option five, see this as Jesus' instructions for how we are to live with one another in the church. Now, once we step outside the doors of the church and enter into the real world, then we have to follow a different set of instructions because truthfully, Jesus' words don't work so well in the real world. But in the church... Jesus' words here are our law, but only in the church. Others will argue, option six, that the sermon only works if we get everything in the right order. First, we need to focus on our salvation. Remember, we are saved by faith and not by works of the law or by works of the Sermon on the Mount. Then we need to focus on grace, a grace that encourages us to obey, but pardon and cleanses within when we fail. Then we need to focus on the Spirit. See, it's only through the power of the Spirit that we can begin to live out these instructions. And then finally, we need to focus on being thoroughly transformed by the gospel. And once we have all of that lined up, then we can focus on obeying what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. It's all a matter of priorities, of putting first things first. And thankfully, the Sermon on the Mount is not a top priority. Okay, quiz time. Multiple choice. There are six possible answers. Suppose we just read our passage for today about not resisting an evil person. A masked gunman walks into our doors clearly intending to shoot me. Do you, A, do nothing in response to Jesus' command not to resist an evil person? B, stand up and announce to the assailant that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life. C, stand up and rebuke the assailant in Jesus' name. D, let me take the bullet while you run as fast as you can in the other direction. E, throw a chair at them to disarm them and then tie them up until the police arrive. Or F, drop them with the 357 Magnum that you always carry on your person. I'm not so sure I want to know your answer there. <laughs> Here's the problem. It feels like every one of these approaches, these six approaches, is trying to evade the sermon rather than trying to obey the sermon. And we get that. It seems impossible. Someone, please, take down the assailant. We'll just skip over. Do not resist an evil person for the moment. It's so hard to live out these things. They sound so wonderful. They just don't sound real. What are we supposed to do? 
And so we decide we need to evade it somehow. And we are right back to my favorite quote of all time from Soren Kierkegaard. The wise Dane wrote, the matter is quite simple. The Bible is very easy to understand, but we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obliged to act accordingly. Take any words in the New Testament and forget everything except pledging yourself to act accordingly. My God, you will say, if I do that, my whole life will be ruined. How would I ever get on in the world? Herein lies the real place of Christian scholarship. Christian scholarship is the church's remarkable invention to defend itself against the Bible, to ensure that we can continue to be good Christians without the Bible coming too close. Oh, priceless scholarship, what would we do without you? Dreadful it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, it is even dreadful to be alone with the New Testament. I love that, except when I am guilty of doing exactly what Kierkegaard is protesting against here, which is often. But it seems like this is the path we choose when it comes to interpreting the Sermon on the Mount. We try to evade. And yet, whenever we try to explain it away, the sermon loses most of its power. And one thing is sure, when Jesus first preached the sermon, his words were, in, were accompanied with tremendous power. In fact, Matthew tells us how powerful it was. Look at Matthew's conclusion to the whole sermon. He writes in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. In other words, what they heard was not try hard in grace, but thus says the Lord, do it. And so maybe we need to take a different look at what Jesus was saying. Scott McKnight writes, the Sermon on the Mount is the mortal portrait of Jesus' own people. Because this portrait doesn't square with the behavior of the church, this sermon turns from instruction to indictment. Ouch, that hurts. But sadly, it's true. See, the fact is, it is only when we read Jesus' words here as demanding our full allegiance that we read it with its full intended force. Bonhoeffer said it this way, humanly speaking, it is possible to understand the Sermon on the Mount in a thousand different ways, but Jesus knows only one possibility. Simple surrender and obedience. Not interpreting or applying it, but doing and obeying it. That is the only way to hear his words. He does not mean for us to discuss it as an ideal. He, means, he really means for us to get on with it. But that's the problem. How? How do we get on with it when most of this seems impossible, unrealistic, and if we were really honest, undesirable? Maybe what we need to do first is to look back on how Jesus approached ethics and the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, to understand what Jesus was saying, we need not only to know what he said, but we need to situate this sermon in its proper context. So what is the right context? Well, actually, there are four aspects that we have to understand. First, Jesus understood this sermon as coming from above. Remember, Jesus was Jewish. 
And Judaism believed that God had given them a covenant. And at the core of that covenant was the Torah, the law. And the Torah was to chart the path for how Israel was to live. So if you were Jewish and you had a moral decision to make and you weren't sure what to do, you would go to the Torah for your answer. And where did this Torah come from? God descended from above and came to Mount Sinai where he revealed his law and his will to Moses. Ask anyone where Israel's law came from, and they would say it came from above. We didn't make it up. This isn't a human invention. God gave us his law. And the prophets understood this as well. That's why they didn't go around saying, do what I say. Instead, they said, thus says the Lord. Why? Because their message was from above. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus never says, thus says the Lord. But you can't read it without feeling that Jesus understood himself as speaking on behalf of God and as God. Remember, Jesus spoke with authority. His words overflowed with divine power. How should we understand the Sermon on the Mount? We should understand it as God's new covenantal law for his people, given to us by our king. We must read it as a law from above. But it's not just a law from above. A law from above explains the feel of some of the sermon, but not all of the sermon. See, a lot of the sermon has a very familiar feel to it. It feels like it's coming from one of Israel's great prophets. And the glory of the prophets is that they brought God's future to bear on the present. And there it is. Scott McKnight's uh, sermon on the mount is also a law from beyond. Scott McKnight now writes, Jesus' ethical posture towards the present was robustly shaped by a certain knowledge of God's future. Jesus' ethics flow directly from God's kingdom. They are kingdom ethics. Read the sermon in that light, and suddenly it all comes to life. The future ought to determine how we are to live today in the here and now. Again, McKnight writes, Jesus' ethic was an ethic for now in light of the kingdom to come. But the sermon is not just a futuristic take on today's world. In Jesus' thinking, the kingdom has come. It's already here, even if it is not yet here in its final, most glorious form. And since that is true, that the kingdom is here, even if it's still future, then we need to live accordingly. See, our ethics are not only from above, but they are also from beyond. God's future kingdom comes to earth and shapes how we are to live. So we have an ethic from above, from God, and from beyond. Our future in God's kingdom, God's future in God's kingdom come to earth. That's what needs to shape us. But even that does not quite contain everything in the Sermon on the Mount. When we read it, it also feels like an ethic from below. It has an earthly feel about it. It feels like wisdom. See, when Israel struggle with a moral question, they not only turn to the law, but they, and they not only turn to the prophets, but they also turned to the wisdom books. See, the Bible doesn't directly answer all of our moral questions. And so we need to discern what we should do. Well, how do we do that? We look at what the Bible says, and we look at Jesus' kingdom values and priorities, and then we apply spiritual wisdom, and we discern what we ought to do. Now, this will sound bad, so prepare yourself. But we live out what the Bible teaches, not 
by doing everything it says, but by discerning from what is written what we ought to do in this moment. Not just by reading and doing, but by discerning how that word applies to us in our de decision today. And that's why we need wisdom. That's why we need discernment. When we read the Sermon on the Mount, we can't help but feel we are sitting at the feet of a great wisdom teacher, learning how to live life to its fullest. Yes, the sermon is from above, and it is from beyond, but it is also most definitely an ethic from below. Above from God, beyond from God's future kingdom come to earth, below it is wisdom, it is discerning God's will for us today. But while the sermon is most definitely all of those things, it still feels like something is missing. That's because this sermon is Jesus through and through. It sounds like him. It acts like him. It feels like him. Why? Because it is him. Few passages share Jesus' way of life more than this one. From top to bottom, this sermon Every word is shaped by who Jesus is and what he came to do. And so we can't really grasp it until we give our heart and soul to King Jesus and participate in his great mission to advance his kingdom throughout the world. See, the Sermon on the Mount is all about who Jesus truly is. And it's about his vision for his people and his world. And it is about the Spirit empowering Jesus' kingdom people to do God's will. Joachim Jeremiah says it this way, what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount is not a complete regulation of the life of the disciples, and it is not intended to be. Rather, what is taught here is symptoms signs, examples of what it means when the kingdom of God breaks into the world which is still under sin, death, and the devil. You yourselves should be signs of the coming kingdom of God, signs that something has already happened, signs that the kingdom has come. Don't miss what Jeremiah just said to us. We should be signs of the coming kingdom of God, signs that something has already happened, signs that the kingdom has come. Bottom line, this is an ethic that only finds its power and meaning in a relationship with Jesus. And as such, it is to be lived out in the context of Jesus' church in community together, advancing God's kingdom on earth. See, we can only be salt and light in the world when we all live out this sermon together. We are the signs that Jesus' kingdom has come and is coming. The Sermon on the Mount is an ethic that requires us to participate in Jesus as our Messiah King. And it is an ethic that finds its meaning in Jesus' vision for his people. Now, there's something else here in the sermon that we often overlook. When we enter into the sermon to do it, when our desire is not to evade Jesus' commands, but to do them, we unleash the power of the Spirit in our lives. Bonhoeffer says it this way, faith is only real when there is obedience, never without it. And faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience. And there it is. We find power when we step out in faith and obey. One of the greatest shows ever on Netflix is Stranger Things. Stranger Things is a story of four teenage boys and a girl named Eleven. Now, Eleven is not your normal kid. Eleven has telekinetic powers, but that came at a cost. She has been raised in a science lab when they were training her to be a weapon to fight against the Ruskies. 
And part of that training involved opening up a portal to the upside down world and traveling into this dark and toxic hidden dimension. The upside down world is pure evil. It is a land of dead things, and it is the land where the Demogorgon lives, a horrific monster that has no face and that feasts on blood. You can't help but to think that the upside down world and hell are closely related. Long story short, Eleven escapes the lab, the lab officials, the bad guys want her back and are after her, and Eleven is rescued by our boys. So far, so good. But when Eleven escaped, so did the Demogorgon. And throughout the whole first season, everyone is running away from the Demogorgon because that is what you do. And those who don't are killed. But although Eleven has all these powers, when she uses them, she gets drained and her powers evaporate. And in the last episode of season one, Eleven and the boys are hiding in this huge building. But both the bad men and the Demogorgon are coming for them. But it is the bad men who find them first. And in order to escape their clutches, Eleven has to use her powers, and she strikes down the bad guys. But now she is drained. She has absolutely no power. And the blood draws the Demogorgon. And sure enough, the Demogorgon finds them. And while they valiantly try to fight it off, it is no use. Without Eleven, it is impossible and Eleven's powers are depleted. And just when the Demogorgon is set to obliterate them, Eleven rises up and enters into the scene again. But now, instead of trying to escape the monster, she decides that this time is the time to confront it. And so she engages it in battle and somehow finds the power, this new power, and with this newfound strength, she throws the Demogorgon against the wall. Now, I'm a pastor, and I see everything through the story of the Bible. It is an occupational hazard. The Demogorgon is pure evil, and it flies up against the wall and is pinned against it with its arms spread out as if it was on a cross. And Eleven, the Christ figure, looks at evil, looks at death, and says, no more. And with that, she defeats the evil through the power of the cross. Trust me, it's all very, very theological. <laughs> Here's the point, so please don't miss it. Eleven is powerless when she is running from her calling to kill the Demogorgon. She is empty and weak and scared. And the very idea of fighting the Demogorgon is overwhelming. And it is totally unrealistic to expect this young girl to battle this monster. She can't win. It's impossible. But when she fulfills her calling and steps into the fray, she unleashes a power she never knew she had. So it is with us. We look at the Sermon on the Mount. Its demands are overwhelming. We know we can't do it. And we struggle even deciding if we want to do it. And so we run away from our calling and try to evade it, to evade all these obligations that Jesus has set before us. But when we enter into the sermon to obey it, we unleash a power that we did not know existed. It is the power of the Spirit at work within us. And all we need to do to find that power is obey. Bonhoeffer was right. He wrote, when all is said and done, the life of faith is nothing if not an unending struggle of the spirit with every available weapon against the flesh.
But here's the good news. We can find power in that struggle when we seek to obey. Now, we have much, 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 much more to say, but that will have to wait for next week and the weeks after. Right now, let's close in prayer. Father God, we look at your demands, and we read the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount as demands. We should turn the other cheek. We should go the extra mile. We should love our enemies. We should be truthful. We should be loving. These are oughts. And yet we just don't know how in the world we are to live them out in this broken, broken world. I, I, I get what Kierkegaard was saying. When people hear these things in the Bible that are clear, we say, how? How are we to make our way in the world if we live like this? We'll get trampled. For most of my life, I've looked at these chapters and I have run in the other direction. They're just too hard. They're just too scary. Give us your spirit so that we will desire to do your will. Give us a vision for who we are. We are the people of the king. And give us a vision for who you are. You are our king. And help us to be wise and discerning so that we can live out your, world, your word in our world, in our lives today, not only just in the church, but in the real world. We are left scratching our head, wondering how we could possibly do this. And so we ask that you would come, that you would open our eyes and open our heart, that we may follow you in all things. This is the cry of our heart. Work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us to rely on that power even as we sing this song together. Stand with us and sing. The blessing of God. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May the God of love and peace be with you all. God bless you. Have a great, great week.